Welcome to the Garage Network Podcast. Join us and the occasional special guest as we discuss everything automotive, from fixing cars as a technician, owning an automotive workshop or business, overall work-life balance, and even the occasional laugh. In this week's episode of TGN Talks, we are joined with industry legend James Dillon talking all things automotive. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, cool stuff. Yeah, well, let, let's just let's go for it and see 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 what happens. Yeah, let's let's see. I'll try not to swear. That's the big thing. I think it's uh, no. Don't worry about that. We don't have to worry about swearing. I'm drinking beer, so it's okay. So, Jeff, you got a beer? Uh, I'm on water. I'm on, I'm on a bit Sorry? of a health kick. I'm on. I'm drinking water. I'm on I a. Did you just? I can't, I can't hear you. I think you're breaking up. You know, right? you know, that's, that's, you're breaking that's up. stuff that's yeah. all around the world. You know, <laughs> all around where we live. But uh, no, I'm on a bit of a health kick, uh, and obviously, I did push it quite hard on Saturday night. So, um, water at the moment. I will be having a beer after. Uh, nice. As, as a treat. As a treat. As a treat. No, good stuff. Good. I'm on a health kick. I'm on two health kicks. I'm actually on my third health kick now. Bizarrely. Yeah, I gave up drinking beer um, in September last year. Oh, Did you? yeah. Oh, do, do you know we said? Do you know when we said you should come to Australia? Maybe he should do that. Wait till you wait till you back on the beers before you. Uh, <laughs> you don't, don't, don't become a teetotaler and a vegan and yeah. come to Australia. <laughs> It's bizarre, and I gave up for a few weeks, and then here we are now. What 14, 15 months later, and. Uh, yeah, not not been not been back on it. Um, yeah, bizarre, bizarre. So that was health kick number one, and uh, that was partly aimed at losing a few pounds. And health kick number two, then I decided to lose a few pounds, and um, I've gone on this. Uh, well, it's a bit of a weird thing. I, I'm like you guys, flat out busy, so I don't have time to have roasted dinner with potatoes uh, like you, Jeff. So no, I, no, I no, it, was, it was steak. It was ribeye fillet <laughs> steak. Jeff. Ribeye fillet steak. Don't rub it in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so I, I I lost a few pounds as well, and I did it. Uh, people were laughing. Uh, being being engineering technical thing, you know, data is king. And um, I looked at I looked at lots of stuff, and um, I follow this guy on a, a podcast on called the Huberman Lab, and he's a oh something to do with brains, and he's a really clever guy. And I listen to that stuff, and it's about gut biomes and all this. And I I got onto this thing we have here called Huel, which is human fuel, and it's basically veg protein ground up into a milkshake and you drink it with almond milk and it's fantastic because when i'm in a course and i'm stopping i've got about six minutes to eat my lunch and normally i'm eating whatever the guys eat we get burgers and chips and stuff and so it's really easy to eat burgers and chips five days a week so i had this human fuel thing and um people said what are you doing if i said well partly to eat a bit better and partly to lose a bit of weight oh how much weight have you lost i have no idea oh you're not measuring it. i said yeah, yeah i'm measuring it what are you getting on the scales i said no no You've got micro measurement and macro measurement. So I'm into macro measurement. And they said, well, how are you doing that then? I said, well, see my belt, yeah, and the buckles on it, yeah, the notches. So, yeah, so I'm trying to get to the next one. And when I make that progress, I've lost some weight. And so I carried the people who didn't think I was serious. So now I'm three notches up on the belt and I'm actually past the last one. And so that's that's my the metric, uh, you know, the data the information and the key performance indicator, it was just belt bucking. So I, I've not, not weighed myself. I don't know how much I've lost, but the belt doesn't lie. I, I, I like it. But, I like but maybe, it you, maybe you just, you know, slowly pulling yourself in and you're going to look like an alcohol. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> sorry, James. I'm, I'm sorry. You just, I'm sorry. just completely wipe that whole lot. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm like sure a zip tie of sausage. Sure. <laughs> make yourself into two sausages just twist it in the middle yeah yeah good stuff so well, okay well, listen jeff are you gonna do an intro or are you gonna I, I, i'll do, look i'll do a, i'll do a bit of an intro but in in case you've not uh you haven't noticed we are here with james dillon from technical topics in the uk um James, James is just a bit of a god, really. Sorry, James, don't get a big head, but he's a bit of a legend. And in in the in the automotive training field, in the manufacturers portal field, um, and in the UK, you have you have like a, a top tech as well, don't you? You do um, like master technician training. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. 
so UK is way well, you need to go to James to uh, get that extra rung and um, yeah and, and enjoy some English English sun, sunshine if there is any. <laughs> yeah, at the minute we've just got water, wall, rain, and wind. Oh, well, that's just how I left it, <laughs> and um, and also we're joined with Mark. <laughs> oh, that's all, thanks. That's okay. James, can I ask you? Have you got a workshop? You got a workshop in in, in England, or are you just? Yeah, so, if you can see in the background, that's the. I'm in the downstairs classroom here. Um, we've got two classrooms in this facility, um, and through through that window, you can see into the workshop. So, uh, it's a training workshop now. We still do the odd. So, I, I, I do a couple of jobs here and there to keep myself in. But we, when we migrated to, to the previous place, we ran it as a full-on repair facility and we did training in between and um as things have moved on we sort of we found ourselves doing more and more training like and less and less um of the repair stuff so we we keep a couple of garages and traders close we don't do any retail um but we do do trade stuff still here um so yeah there's a there's a workshop out there with a a hoist um there's standing room for maybe eight or nine cars um and so, yeah, we, we run it really pro predominantly as training, um, but, but yeah, do still do trade stuff. So we get, and, and only the interesting stuff. So I've got to that stage in my career where, you know, d d uh, I really like and relish the tricky stuff only. So if you, if you bring me something normal, it's quite boring. So it's only going to take me an hour to fix it. I'm like, oh, that's a bit disappointing. <laughs> you, want <laughs> some real, you want some real curly stuff, yeah? Yeah, real curly stuff. So we had well, one of the boys that came on the Otis course bought a nightmare car, which is fantastic. So when we do the dealer tool training, if we get some horrendous job that one of the guys is stuck on and they bring it along, it's fabulous because it, it sort of shows them that with the application of a bit of science and a bit of logic and benefits of the dealer tooling, you know, you can turn this stuff around. So, yeah, we still get involved. Yeah, yeah like cool. I still do. Yeah, because I wasn't sure whether well, I think last time we spoke, I, I wasn't sure whether you still had a fully functioning workshop as well as training school, or whether it's all mainly training. So it's mainly training, mainly training now. Yeah, yeah. We, we we migrated. Yeah, that's and, and and the fun stuff, which is the diagnostics with all care and no responsibility. You didn't have yeah. to do it with the customer. You get to you get to play with the job and don't have to do it with <laughs> yeah. the customer. Yeah, do you know, yes. And and in, in the later years with, with the other workshop, I focused much more on the trade because my customer service muscle got worn out. I couldn't have that conversation about, you know, about, oh, I've been to these other places and it's still doing this and I've spent all my money. And I, my customer service muscle was exhausted. Um, and I, I, to be fair then to the customers, I thought the only way I'm going to do this is really to sort of se separate that out and really put the put the put the garage in the way if you know what i mean so i would yeah. deal garage to garage trade to trade and they would they would deal with the retail customer and i found that worked and that allowed me to focus on you know what i love the trickiness of diagnosis i, I, yeah, I think i think you might have cracked it there james i, I think you've got the uh, golden egg <laughs> you know you, you get a you get to fix cars deal with like-minded people and and not have to deal with, with that but with the customer end and and I, and I dare say for some great customers without customers we wouldn't have a job you wouldn't have a job you know but yeah. um having that conversation yeah, well you still uh, I, I, I guess i guess at the end of the day you still have customers those customers are wholesale trade so yes. not not retail not retail or retail trade which you want they're trade customers they're not retail yes. they're not they're not they're not people off the street I, I guess um a few guys that i know have done that here in australia have had some i mean how do you go in the uk we had a, a few guys here in australia had a lot of problem with a lot of other and that do that sort of thing can have difficulties with other workshops paying because they the, the communication level lines or communication lines don't seem to get translated through the workshop to the customer that they're going to get a four thousand dollar bill at the other side of this, because obviously those that are good at doing diagnostic work, like I mean I, I class myself as okay at doing diagnostic work, quite good. Um, I don't want to put tickets on myself, but I do a pretty good job of it. Um, but when you're doing work for other trades, sometimes they they can be a bit reluctant to 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 communicate to their and they're bad at communicating with their customer um, about how 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 much the bill is going to be and I think that's yeah. a, that's a big problem and I'm very good at explaining to customers that when we get a when we get a curly job like those curly jobs I said look we're going on a journey together yeah. <laughs> so how I describe it to a customer and I'm like we're gonna 
we're going to go on this journey and, and, and I'm going to communicate with you everything that I'm going to test and everything I'm going to do and I'm going to explain why the logic behind why we do it. Um, and, yes, I can I, I totally get how exhausting that is and, and how exhausting that would have been. Um, but I yeah. sort of also feel like, well, they're the ones paying the bills, so at whatever point, and I'm going to, we're going to go, you know, hour by hour or, 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 or two hour by two hour blocks and and and, and, and sort of explain that to them. So, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I've got a radical thought process. So, so communication is absolutely key. Um, for the retail customers, really, I, I suppose that's where it got very difficult explaining down at that level, you know, for the 15th time that day. And I just felt uh, it wasn't the business I wanted to be in. So dealing with retail, trade to trade is brilliant. And, and, and I, I really started off when I went, started off mobile doing trade to trade. Um, and the retail started to creep in when I had a base and that people could come and find me. Um, whereas the trade to trade, when I was dipping around to garages, it was no, no problem. So I, I, I got sucked into a bit of retail and then sort of curtailed that and, and kept on the trade to trade. And um, the communication is, is very interesting. Um, and it depends on your customer, the level of understanding that they've got about what you're doing. And it, there's a really fine line between explaining and over-explaining and uh, explaining proactively and explaining reactively. So we would always seek authorization to go up to a level. And um, so uh, uh, we really are keen to detach hours from effort because it matters not a jot how long I spend, it, it's really about the result. And if my, you know, however long I've been doing that, 30 odd years of experience gets me the win quickly, then that's part of my unique selling proposition. And I'm not spinning out the hours equally. And, and the way I explain that, if I'm rubbish and I, and I take you by the hour and it takes me much longer, which is the unfair way? Is it better to, for me to be a rubbish mechanic? And we talked to guys who were coming on training about them leveraging, when they come on training and they invest this money to, to learn this stuff, um, by the hour is, is, a, is a really quick way of getting poor when you get good. This is interesting because I saw, um, <clears throat> we all know uh, Mario Rojas from Super Mario Diagnostics, but he, he posted this on, on uh, I think, one of the US Facebook sites today, and it was... You, you know, if you, if you get good at doing something, at diagnosing something, do you, you know, how do you, how do you charge what used to take you four hours? Do you still charge you four hours or do you, you know, I know what, what that problem is, bang, it's doing 30 minutes or do you charge 30 minutes? There's, no, there's you can't a, charge 30 minutes. I, I agree it, you can't charge 30 minutes. You've got to, it's like the technician that hits something with a hammer and, you know, it's like, it might have only been 50 cents to hit something with a hammer, but it's 10 years of working out what to hit. Mm. And knowing what to hit is is part. That's part because because obviously all, all, over that time you've you've invested in equipment, you've done some training. You, look, the, the the list goes on. You've bought a new torch to make it easier. You, you know it. it um, but there's still there's still fees involved. Um, it's, but it's a tricky one, and I, and I, I don't want to I don't want to start you know going online saying what we should charge no uh, no i'd like to ask that. how do you quantify that then james so do you just like is it like fee for service like is there a, like if it yeah, takes so you how would you how would you quantify that what would you what's your advice so we, the, the only so to start with uh, this the interesting the beginning it dictates how it will end so in the beginning we have to do an assessment and so we have a we have a fairly standard fee for assessing it and that's really sort of sizing up how, how curly, as you put it, will this job get? Could it go? And we set the expectation on the assessment. So we have a the assessment gets you the, the initial look uh, and the assessment is undefined in terms of how long it takes or how big it gets because we don't know what's going to be wrong with the car until it gets here. But we have a defined, you know, we're going to book an X number of these in for a period of time and we should be able to get to do the assessment and we, we have the caveat that if it's something simple we find that there's a chafed wire in the engine loom where it runs over the cam cover oh do you know what happy days we, we've sussed that that will be the end of it really because we found that in that part of that assessment and it's not going to be tricky and any competent tech should have found that so there's there's no premium in skill or knowledge or we've not used extra resources that we've got in the workshop that's been done as a nice job uh, uh, but they're very thin on the ground as a, as a subtext um, but during that assessment then we look and we scope the job up does this look like it could be horrendous 
And if so, at the end of the assessment, we give the customer the option to abort the mission. And we yep. take that mindset that this could be a nightmare. Do you, are you, so I'm, I'm going to spell out the scope of, and we normally use the phrase like the, the last 10 times we've seen this sort of repair, it's turned into being this big. And I don't want to scare you off, but I want to set the expectation of order of magnitude yep is either here or here. And, and we're happy at the minute to give you what we found and then let, let you go away and make a decision because what we don't want is we, we, we always go for win-win in the relationship. So we have to win and make a living and pay for the overheads and support our families. The customer has to win in having their car fixed within the, the bounds of a reasonable repair. And in a relationship, at the outset, if you can't get to win-win, if you think that's going to be a win-lose relationship, um, and that can come from communication, expectation, factors that aren't really affecting the wheels turning, these are all human psychology things, we have that conversation early doors and go, all right, this is how big it looks. And we, we go for a part budget. We go, right, you need to provision X hundred or X thousand pounds to get you to the next level. We need a ceiling to work up to. Now, we're not going to spend all that money, but we need to, give, we need to have the freedom to be able to go through because the, the, what we also find psychologically is if you're thinking about a job and you get to the point where you've got to give an update and it breaks your rhythm, uh, getting back into that job is quite tricky. So we like the freedom to work within a in a bounds to, to make really good progress and almost to go, boom, right, we've got that now. So we, we had a thousand pounds budget. We're about 600 and we, we've got sight. We now know what it is. And we would give an update at that stage. We might even affect the repair and go, oh, brilliant news, phone back the customer. You set a budget of a thousand. We're coming in at 600. Uh, um, and it's actually done. So happy days. Or if it turns the other way, we go to the option. Look, we're £400 into your thousand budget. We're 40% of the way through the money. And it really looks like it's going to be worse than that. This is shaping up to be a £6,000 you know, pound repair on a transmission or what, what have you. And being able to be honest and open and, and yeah. really on the principles of under-promising and over-delivering. Yes. I'm never I run my business that way. Yeah, I've totally right, right, exactly. We've had that. I've had four of those conversations in the last week. Is to go look at you know this is this is what we're going to have to do to fix your car and what what which way do you want us to go? Um, yeah. And and exactly that is is you need that you need to you need to set that bar really. You know you're going to have to spend you know. Seven do you, to do, 10, you do it like that, Mike? Do you, do yes. You, do you set a okay? That, that, so you, exactly you don't just keep journey. asking for another hour or another no, two hours. No, no. I I set that expectation. I said, look, we have an initial assessment charge. And we assess the job, we come out the other side of that and go, right, this is what we think is happening. This is where we need to go. This is in the in previous jobs. This is where we've ended up. You need to be prepared to be spending X amount of dollars to fix your car. So, for example, today um, we had a turbo on a Mercedes that was leaking oil and we went, right, it's bad. It's not going to pass its MOT, as you would call it in the UK, James, or our registration inspection. Um, and it's going to be, you know, roughly seven to ten thousand dollars to fix everything on your car. Now, I, my personal belief is I don't think it's worth. It's not adding any value to your car. So I don't know. It's a car we'd never seen before. It's a customer I don't know. And I've just gone look. This is this is your assessment. This is what we've done. This is where we're at. And I just don't think it's worth going any further. But the the, the decision is up to you. Here's all the estimates. Um, obviously, everything's subject to dismantling, and as we go through, things can change. But I set your worst case scenario at this. So to, and, and also finding that it needed other things like your brakes are going to need doing, it's going to need, um, you know, and, and at the end of that, it was blowing smoke. Uh, at the beginning of that, so they're, they're complaining about it blowing black smoke. And I said, well, you've probably got some other issues. This may or may not fix your problem, but you still may come out the other side of that $10,000 poorer and still blowing black smoke. We're not addressing that issue. We're addressing the issues that we can see. Um, and that's exactly how we I approach our business. And it's a it is it's an initial assessment. If we can fix it in that initial assessment, happy days, great, everyone's loving it. We're all good. If we can't at that point, it's it's a it, it's it's as we have to go. But you know, typically when you're talking to people on the phone, that's that's the journey that I describe to people. Yeah. It's 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 so we're going in this together. You've got to trust me. Um, I'm going to advise you as much as I can, and I'll try to preempt you as much as I can. And I always always doesn't matter whether it's breaks or service everything we over we over quote we quote the highest possible denominator 
And if the price of the job comes in less, it's it's a win for the customer, not you know, yeah, no, it's you just can't you can't take that risk of I don't want to ring anyone with a variation halfway through a job. Yeah, yeah quite. You know, yeah. So. It's very difficult. And and some of those jobs, it depends also on the, you know, the car and the customer have to be analysed in equal measures that you cannot detect, detach one from the other and they are a party and you've got to, you know, somebody once told me, if you can fix the customer, fixing the car is going to be very easy. Yeah. And that, that's part of the, you know, the psychology of bringing them on board with the way that you're doing stuff. But, but uh, equally, that- you make a really good point there, Mike. Um also, when you get a car that's that's been through the wars and it is worn out, um, the customer comes with a con- specific concern that they want you to fix, but the whole car is worn out. And uh, often I phrase that, what you're asking me to do is just to take one egg out of an omelette. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. All your analogies are back at food. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Every time we end up back at food, so. I'm gonna. I want to know what James is having for dinner. Um, but we'll, 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 <laughs> so it's we'll, an endless omelet. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, 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 I have to admit, today was really difficult because the lady was pregnant, and she came in, and, she, and the husband's telling me it's leaking oil. Uh, and I said, "Look, let me before we do anything. Can I just let me look at the car?" Now I don't. I did, these these are new customers, and I, I just I didn't charge them anything. Well, we we looked over the car to do a service and do an inspection for Rego. Um, uh, to do an inspection for Rego based in, in February. It's due for Rego in February. They didn't ask us to do the inspection, but we looked over the car and went, oh, my God, this thing is its pouring oil out, like it's leaking oil in front of me. It's not going to pass its MOT. Uh, needs tyres, not going to pass its MOT. So it's going to need all of that stuff for Rego, and he's asking me to fix. Uh, they're asking me to fix the black smoke issue, and I'm going, well, I can't even, like an unregistered car is not worth anything. So you're going to have to spend X before we even go, she's like, we, and she said to me, she said, oh, the car's in pretty good condition. And I'm like, God, it's done 300,000 kilometres and it's and it's it's clapped out. Like it's in a Mercedes-Benz ML270. It's just had it. The diesel, it's just yeah. got blown black smoke. I didn't even take the cover off to see if it had black death. But it was the oil pouring out of the turbo was bad enough. Like it was, you put a litre in and a half a litre would come out while it was idling. But she was upset. She was upset. She's crying. She's pregnant. She's got no money. And you just got this whole, and I'm like, this so guy's not good enough, mate. You should have done something. You should have fixed your Ollie. No, <laughs> no, because she actually said, she said, "Well, what can I do just to keep it going for a couple of months?" I said, "You can keep it going for a couple of months. It's not due for Rego till February." So I said, "There's nothing stopping you, but in February, it's going to be worth nothing." So my yeah. advice is to bail now, and you know, buy, buy yourself a cheaper car to repair. You know, these European things that are dearer. But that's you know, that's my. My dad, yeah. that, and that's happened a couple of times in the last little while. And we get some really good Google reviews going, thanks for your honesty. Because I suddenly mm. go, look, well, we can fix anything. But is it yes. worth fixing that? Yeah. I mean, we can that's sit fine. here all day and, and do rear main seals, front main seals, do the rear main seal again, do the front main seal again. As we move an oil leak from the front of the motor to the back of the motor to the front yeah. of the motor yeah. to the back of the motor, all because yeah. it's done 250,000 kilometres or 200,000 miles and it's got terrible blow-by. You see, that's um, 200,000 miles isn't that bad in the UK, is it? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah, that's normal. That's average. <laughs> no, but, but, the, but it's got so much blow-by that the actual, like looking at the physics and the problem is, is that we've got a, we've got a pressurisation issue and it, it doesn't matter how many times we do front and rear main cells. I'm just, all you do, and you're right, you're doing the misjust, you're doing, you're mistreating your customer and a mis- just justice to your customers because you're not explaining to them. If, if I said to them, I said, well, you've got air going past the pistons and you're putting excess, excess pressure in your crankcase and that just pushes the oil out. And it's gonna, it doesn't matter how many times we do this, but we're yeah. just going to, we're flogging a dead horse here. And, it, and it's, yeah. I, I can keep doing it, but I, I don't, I don't want, well, to be honest, we wouldn't keep doing it. We would explain yeah. that to a customer in the first place and go, look, I think you're better to, to find a lower kilometre car and do something else or, or time, to spend, time to put your money towards something else. Yeah, it's a really interesting point that, that you know, in, in, in again, back to engineering principles, I think, you know, where a lot of guys struggle and get into a relationship that's toxic with a customer, they've, they've, they've dealt with the first thing first and they've gone, oh, like, like if that's a, a brilliant example of the, the oil seal leaking and they haven't thought about the root cause of that. Maybe it's a seal that's worn out and they've gone, right, we're going to put the seal in and they've maybe dropped the transmission and dropped the flywheel off and put the seal on and put it back together. And now they're into a toxic relationship because they missed the root cause. The initial analysis where, you know, and, and the, the really weird thing about diagnostics 
and the process of charging for the evaluation, people miss that the evaluation is the critical thing that derives the next step. And if you skimp on that, if you give it for free, if, you don't, if you're not comprehensive, you end up treating symptoms and you get symptom distraction. Oh, it's leaking oil out of the front now, do that. Oh, it's leaking oil out of the back now, do that. And all you're chasing the symptoms because you haven't done your root cause analysis or your initial inspection correctly. And guys that are giving Diag or guys that aren't really in to it yeah are treating symptoms and that's where the customer relationship breaks down because you're it's like an unraveling jumper you pull on a thread and all you're left with then is a ball of wool and two sleeves because the job's unfolded there's so many things wrong that you're not dealing with the root cause hmm. mm. yeah really yeah it's all, our entire trade is full of cause and effect if you treat yeah. the effect and not the cause you're going to have the same effect somewhere else yeah absolutely yeah Oh, yeah, sorry, I, th- I just made us digress for half an hour there. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you did something. I don't know, Jeff, have you got any questions? For yeah, yeah, look, I, I have got a couple of questions. Um, I, I kind of, I, I'd like to know a bit of um, the history behind uh, uh, James Dillon. You know, mm. uh, sort of what, what you've done over the years, and how, how we, I know you mentioned before that you did some mobile head scratches, and 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 now you've got your TTH uh, HQ, but. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. T- how did it happen? Where did it come from? Yeah. So uh, my, mine's a well-worn path. My dad was a, a mechanical guy and I started fiddling about when he was doing sort of jobs at home at the weekend. Uh, me, a, a gangly young lad of the age of about 10, I'd be out there helping for pocket money. And really that's why I, I sort of got into the, the mechanical thing. I was taking radios apart and all that sort of stuff. I was an archetypal fiddling. How does it work? Right. I know how it works, but I can't get it back together as that was my early part of the journey was was real fiddling with stuff and yeah mechanic in with my dad gave me a good indication and uh, somebody made me laugh the other day they showed me one of these pictures it said you think you could hurt my feelings i used to hold the torch for my dad (laughs) 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 oh i think we've all suffered with that i had a pretty calm dad but i'm pretty bad at my son my son does that he's on my what are you doing Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh dear! I'll never so, yeah, get that, old that one. Never get old. No. So so and and really, I, I then got into mechanics. And so I started off with motorcycles. Uh, when I sort of left school, I got into a, a sort of apprenticeship scheme, motorbikes, and then I went to work for a, a little garage, a village garage that would be doing anything from. It was out in the sticks and quite an affluent area, but there was a mix of farmers and and normal people and then rich people with bonkers cars. So I remember one day I was doing a service on a silver shadow. And then the next day I was doing a a clutch on a Ford Super Dexter tractor. And uh, that in my formative years was brilliant because I'd get thrown all sorts of stuff out of left field. Um, And I I spent a good period of time there. And then I I sort of wanted maybe three or four years there. I wanted to get into the dealer way of doing stuff. So I took a job with a franchise. I went to work for Volkswagen Group um, in one of their garages. And that was pretty good. That opened up my eyes to, up to that stage, I was just doing college-based training. But with the dealership... Volkswagens were good? Yeah, uh, Volkswagens, yeah. That's when Volkswagens were good, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they were definitely good to me. Yeah. Good to me, yeah. Um, so I should have rung James when I was rebuilding the Sirocco. Is that what you were saying? We, well, I've, yeah. I, I, I had an 83 Sirocco here that was nice. built in nice. West Germany. No, 93. 93. It's the last one of the last ones built in West GT, Germany. The GT2. Anyway, oh, okay. you, no, so you worked yeah. to be franchise with uh, Volkswagen. Yes, and that's why I got into training with really, Jeff. So I, I was up to the National Learning Centre and I did my first course. I never forget it was a basic electrics course. Um, and, and that sort of switched me into that whole, um, you know, I wasn't really a voracious reader or a learner that way. I learned visually and I was great at picking, picking stuff to part and then getting into it. And that sort of switched me into actually there's a formal structure of education here. And um, I really got into that and I stuck with that franchise for a couple of years, I suppose. Then I wanted a change. So I went to work for a Ford dealership and um, that was a bit like night and day, sort of di- different culture, different customers, faster moving stuff, more more faults. Um, and it was quite a big workshop. Um, but again, the, I was very interested in doing difficult stuff. And so I would be always given the curveballs 
and the tricky stuff because of my experience I'd up to, up to that stage was quite wide and varied so yeah I used to do all the awkward stuff and and that's really what switched me into the diag and the electrical I, I really got into that um, and was was a sort of a magnet I was attracted to really awkward jobs um and then, then I went into a sort of training spin. It was at Volkswagen. I went to work at the college and I was training some young lads for half a day a week. And I sort of got into the training thing at the same time, very casually, it was sort of level two, level three, basic stuff. Um, and while I was working at Ford, a job came up with Krypton, the big engine tuning people as a training instructor. And so uh, from the Ford garage, we went into training then and spent sort of seven or eight years working at Krypton from in training. And then I went into sort of national accounts role, tr you know, working with manufacturers of cars, um, talking about test routines and regimes. And I sort of had a pretty nice uplift into engineering perspective of diagnosis and more formal, you know, sort of hands on stuff. Um, I decided to get a bit of management training along that journey as well. And uh, after about seven or eight years at Krypton, I left and went to work for a, a paint, big paint company, ICI. Uh, and I helped them with uh, business management systems, completely swerved out of diagnos diagnostics and fixing cars. I went into the management side of the business, um, which was really good. I ended up helping, working with a team of uh, national implementers of systems into body shops as it was and it gave me a really good solid foundation for my training in business I was then working with garages to implement massive changes and yeah I spent about four years there there's a lot of traveling the kids were young and I decided at that stage then all right I need to get back home really I was working away sort of four or five nights a week and it was really quite tricky so um yeah I came back and set the mobile business up then and uh, got got a car got a load of gear and, and, and basically went around garages in my local town seeing if they had trouble they needed help with and um yeah sort of it went it went then self-employment from that period grew and grew we, we that built that business had a couple of towns worth of regular customers and had a little round and spent my time you know fixing those broken cars that led to the workshop the workshop led to training and the training led to here and that's the sort of migration really of where, where I am and my experience to date. So, yeah, pretty that's cool right, journey. That's fantastic. That's I like great, that. Great story. I like that. And, when, and when, you, when you were saying about, you know, being 10 years old and your dad was a mechanic and you were pulling you were pulling things to bits, I was just thinking, God, I'm glad your, dad's, your dad wasn't a vet and you didn't have pets. <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, no, that's a good story. I like it. Uh, and, yeah. the, and the, uh, you know, you shining the torch for your dad. Oh, God. My, my dad was into boats and, you know, I was... I was the youngest of four and, you know, whatever he did, whatever he was doing, I wanted, I wanted to be involved. I wanted you know, just let me help. And, yeah. you know, I was probably shining and torch everywhere, but where he wanted it to be. And, and, and I probably got a good belt for it as well. But, yeah. uh, hey, James, I do have to ask, whatever happened to Krypton? Uh, we yes, had a, I had a Krypton scope, by the way. One of, one of my first, one of our first scopes with my dad here, we, we, we had yeah, nice. No, yeah, and um, they—they sort of. Oh, they—they. They, I think they lost their way a little bit. I think they were left behind with technology advancements. I think they suffered a little bit. The company suffered from multiple corporate ownerships. To be honest, Mike, and um, you know, they, they were taken over by a company that were taken over by a bigger company. And yeah. I think the the focus in that business there were some absolutely crazy good engineers in there. Um, who had a really fantastic base of understanding and knowledge and developed some really cool tools. But I think with the, the higher leadership in the, in the group companies really starved them of, of the oxygen of development and they got left behind. If you look at Pico now with the Pico scope, Krypton had a Pico scope in the in the you know early nineties, they and had an, an engine analyzer module. Yeah, yeah, but you know, we couldn't which, you couldn't view it. We couldn't view it. You could do you remember? Do you remember the cathode ray tube? The ref, the, yeah. the flashing. I oh, know trying to get you trying to get it so you weren't having a bloody epileptic fit while you were watching the screen. Yeah, <laughs> do, yeah. and just trying to get it to slow down, and it was yeah. We're so spoiled today. So, so spoiled. spoiled. Yeah, so spoiled. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, they, they they were left behind, but they had they had some really cool stuff, and um, it's a shame. You know, technology moves on. If you don't, if you're not going forwards, you're going backwards, and yeah. and I think we see that in a lot of industries that people can tend to rest 
you know, one of the things that drives me on here with, with the stuff we do, we're messing about with hydrogen cars at the minute. We have a Mirai in here and we're reverse engineering the Mirai. Um, and, and people go, what are you messing about with that for? You know, it's never going to happen. It's not going to hang on a minute. If we're not going forward, if we're not looking at what's coming, when it comes, we're going to be behind the curve. So um, I think a lot of companies and businesses and technicians also have to focus on that striving to move on striving to progress what is coming around the corner if you a lot of you know it's very easy to sit into the very warm water of contentment thinking that you've smashed this when in fact what, what's happening is you're actually being left behind by not not progressing so yeah krypton were were unfortunately in, in that zone so they still exist in a way they do lifts and stuff but not the core krypton that we used to know Love yeah, the, I think, with the I think somebody tools. bought the name, didn't they? I, I remember Krypton disappearing. And and then, uh, you know, two or three years later, they came back. I think, did, did Omitech buy them? Who, I yeah. think you, some, the, some the, other company. And they, there'd be, there'd be techs on our page that wouldn't even know what they were. There'd be techs that wouldn't know what a... Like the scopes we had back then, I mean, those engine analyzers were just insane in size and we're so spoiled to look at a Pico. Like my dad looks at a Pico now and goes, oh my, he's 80. He's, oh What's my that? God, from what we, what we can do and what, and, and what it's, what can you know, achieve with such a small box and a computer is just insane. Yeah. yeah you know? True. 12, 12 square meters of cathode ray dropped into the size of a paperback now. <laughs> 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 Jeff, I don't, I, I've got a question for you, Jen. What, what um, so I, obviously you're you're right at the forefront. You've got high, hydrogen cars in the in the in the in your test facility. What what are some of the courses that you're running? And for us looking at the UK and and even the US, yeah. UK probably more so is is looking into a crystal ball for us as to what's coming next. What what are the courses? What are you running? What's the yeah. what's the hot topics over there at the moment for your training? Yeah, it's a really it's really interesting. I I, th I thought before I came on, I sat and jotted down the de the amount the number of days of training that we do here. So we currently, if you came to technical topics, we've got seventy two days of individual training days that we run as a program, various programs here, and we've got another twenty seven in development. So we've got a sort of catalogue of ninety nine days worth of training on different subject matter. Um, so we, the hot topics here, a lot of guys are trying to keep ahead. So we run two technician development programs, diagnostic technician, which would be, um, you know, really the nuts and bolts of how to effectively diagnose systems on cars. So we cover petrol engine management, diesel engine management, diagnostic principles, electrical fundamentals, CAN bus in vehicle networking, uh, ADAS and chassis systems. And these are two day modules that the guys sign up to a, a program of learning. So they come down every six weeks and do two days of training. Uh, to, to bring them on in terms of knowledge and development. And we do that at that level of diagnostic tech, and then we do a, a, a higher level, which is at master technician. So about four years ago, we signed up with the IMI, who are the awarding body. They're really the body that look after technical uh, education and in the uk and we signed up and became a center so we 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 now issue qualifications that are nationally recognized where before we were doing our own certification but these uh, are nationally re nationally recognized uh, quals so the diagnostic tech and mass tech mike are, are great where guys are looking to get better and quicker and faster and for us those programs are about improving effectiveness in the guy's business, making them able to fix more cars. And a nice side effect is they get a qualification that's recognized, you know, internationally. And our focus is always about really on improving, improving the guys. Um, EV is big. We, we, we got into the EV journey. I bought a Prius off a dealer as a scrapper. Um, must be about to 10, 11 years ago. And that was my first introduction to resurrect. Got this thing, came on a low loader and we, we did the old journey about replacing, there's nickel metal hydride batteries. We did the journey about replacing that. Got into EV. We drove that car around for a couple of years and really sort of got into it. But EV is is big for us. We've got a course going on today with um, a higher level EV. So guys that have been, we've got level two, level three, and level four EV, and they have sort of service tech, diagnostic tech, master tech level. And we've got a guy that, we've got a group of guys that are coming in now at the sort of above the master tech level. So they're doing diagnosis of EV issues. Um, that's been a big thing, really, that drive for EV. And I see you guys working with, with Bosch there to do EV training in your network. And I'd fully wholeheartedly recommend 
garages get into that. Um, it's a, it's a very big question for the techs, Mike, going, when is the right time to get into EV? Um, the right time is any time before it's too late. Yeah. When will it be too late uh, when it's too late? Uh, when is that? Well, you'll know because you've missed the boat. Um, and so, yeah, really to get to, to, ju to jump a stuff, that knowledge at the minute, to get to get all that stuff inside your garage to start to attract that business. And we have been running that EV course officially now for about four years. Um, and we, we really recommend garages that want to be the go to garage um, to get into EV and start pushing that with their custom base and attracting that work in EV drivers. Are very interesting we have a we have a tongue-in-cheek saying that an ev driver is very much like a vegan because ev drivers and vegans will tell you they are before they are before you ask them <laughs> so the first thing when you meet them you know i'm a vegan i'm an ev driver so uh, it's very interesting <laughs> notice most vegans are ev drivers so <laughs> yeah, you know yeah yeah absolutely there is there is a and, and it, brings, it brings a really interesting point and although we say that quite humorously those customers have very different expectations. And also the early adopters are very enthusiastic about that technology. And you better know your onions as a garage if you go out to say that you fix EVs because these guys and girls that drive electric vehicles are enthusiastic owners and they know, you know, they know quite a lot about those cars. And they're not afraid to spend money on them. They want them maintained. They're very good customers. And because they're, you know, leading edge, they want, they want them looked after well. But the reality of EV for the wider automotive business is, of course, the work available on an EV. There's no clutch. There's no, you know, there's no coil packs. There's no timing belts. There's no service. There's no oil. There's no air. Um, there's, the service work is scaled right back. They're generally more reliable. And I think for me, it's a really interesting, as a garage guy looking out there going, I need to secure EV in my business as a core pillar to ensure I have a business into the future. And although when it starts, it's going to be quite small, the volumes will build, but the volume, the big thing is the volume of other work as they become adopted will scale back. Um, and it's a big shift. The hugest shift is, and it's early days and we're in the seed zone of that. But if we, if we fast forward, if you have a five-year business plan, EV better be part of it and a scaling back of other work ought to figure in there as well. And um, yeah, I yeah. think and, uh, I had this conversation with, uh, we had a, a podcast with Michael, Michael Verlo, the head of automotive in Bosch um, just a couple of days ago. And, and it's very, very prominent to go. He asked me, we were talking about what happens. And, and one of the things that I said is obviously there's less work. Um, and my, we have a database of about 3,000 customers at the moment. I believe that needs to be is for my business projection, and we need to have that at about nine or 10 once we start to get into that EV hybrid realm um, to be able to be doing the same amount of work or similar amount of work that we're doing now. We need three. For every one customer we have, we need three EV customers. Yeah, it's a good show. It's a good estimation. I think hybrids are brilliant because they're the worst of both worlds. Yes, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy with hybrid because that's still you still got all the major repair opportunities of internal combustion engine so you've still got you know uh, failure modes um when your favorite brand gets into hybrids at the minute we we're also a little bit spoiled that generally you know toyota and honda and nissan who, who don't make a bad car are the early exponents of of electric vehicles and hybridization when some of the other brands you know the less robust brands no names no pack drills get into ev i think there's going to be more interesting work but still the volumes are going to be you know slightly dinted um yeah undoubtedly um but in terms of other popular courses then of course we're we're knee deep in uh, oem diagnostics it's been a big thing uh here since 2011 really it started to open up so we're 11 years into that journey and they uh, the garages are sort of realizing that some of the complexity in the motor vehicle has led to uh, gaps in in capabilities of existing scan tools. So my XYZ scan tool cannot do this function. The car has gone wrong in this way. I need to replace this module, or it's got a, it's got an issue. I think there might be a bulletin. It might need a software update to fix that. And so the profile of the repair process has changed a little bit. That we need to be tapping into OEM bulletins 
on some age of cars. So there is a window this works in. There's old stuff that it doesn't, but there's a sweet spot of cars where actually checking the, the manufacturer's portal for a bulletin for the concern you've got to make sure it's not so solved by a software fix has sort of driven the business a little bit into garages that are more, more forward seeking have gone, we need to be into the dealer diag because not only does it offer us extra things that we can do, but it's core to the process of not chasing a ghost and not going, oh, I've got eight hours into this job and I can't find anything that's wrong. I'll make that's a software update. Oh, bingo, half an hour on, on a tool with a software download and then you've solved the concern. And so that's shifted the focus a little bit into yeah, OEM diag. So we, we've been along that journey of understanding, learning, and then training techs on OE diag. Yeah. And that's on multiple brands? Multiple brands. So I've got my, you see the boxes behind me there. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're the stat, so they're the, the current tools that we've got. So multiple brands. So um, we currently are running with Volkswagen Group, uh, I'm PSA or Stellantis. Them. I'm trying to count yeah. them all. <laughs> trying to count them. Uh, and um, yeah, PSA, BMW. So we, we started off with um, the, the tools that were really awkward to use. And we went, right, who, what do you need help with? Well, Volkswagen as a dealer tool was really difficult to get going, to install, uh, to, 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 to have on your PC. And then navigation and use and operation would fry your brain because it's made by Germans who are ruthlessly logical but don't understand common sense. And so it, it can drive you around the twist. Hang on a minute. To get that function, you need to double right click on that icon, run three times around the laptop and pat the aerial twice, and bingo, the screen comes up. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's crazy good. So we felt that one was was one that people really needed help with. So and that was the first to deal a tool training that we developed and got to grips with. And, and that's a really popular and successful course. And we have a, we have an absolute hoot on that. And we have guys that come hating it. And we do a quick pulse survey of the guys as they enter the room. Right, who loves this tool? And you can see them, the, the red is coming up from their chin to the top of their head. You know, why did you add, what do you mean? And uh, so you guarantee you hate this tool because it spanks you every time you use it, it's kicking your backside. You you don't use it the it's same way twice. Every time I've switched on Otis, it smacked me around the face in some <laughs> in some form of another. <laughs> if you listen very carefully, Jeff, it's laughing to you with a German. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm I'm certainly looking forward to um when you come to Australia, James. Yeah, I, I, I think we should get yeah. you out here. To work. I think we we are very look as as things progress. I think we really we really need that style of training. And I know you are the man to go to for all of those. And we've spoken about this. Like, we need these these all these multi <clears throat> dealer tool training for all multiple brands. But it's so, easy. Yeah. You just get all you have to do. You just get any J twenty five thirty four box, and you can just do everything. Just yeah. do everything. Everything the manufacturers do. We, know, we it. know that's not true. We know James, that's not true. <laughs> we know that's not true. Well, it's it's a very interesting thing. Yeah, the journey again. We we we're a little bit. It's really interesting to see you guys have now got that up and running, and it's all sort of going. We've been on that journey ourselves, and we we've, we've been along that track of pass through. Um, pass through is a great thing. It's the it's the dream, really. It really is. Um, it's like a spork. Why have a spoon and a fork when a spork will do? Do you know what I mean? It will do everything. You just hold it at this end and you do it. In, in essence, yes, it works as an engineering solution, but in practice, it, it doesn't deliver that which you would expect it to. So pass through is, is a, and it's difficult again to know where the road runs out for pass through. And generally, it's a bit like driving a car a bit quicker. You know when you've overstepped your skill level with the power because you're now looking out the back window going forwards. And a pass-through can be a bit like that on the jobs that you don't know that it's outstretched its capabilities until you're the wrong side of the white line. And um, that can end up with a module not being programmed or a function not being uh, carried out. Uh, and, and it's being being positioned in the market by by people as the savior and it has got a function but it's a swiss army knife and it, it can do a lot of things well and it's probably realizing the things it doesn't do so well and steering away from that but of course 
the problem with the diagnostic job is you you, you get your, your your OE portal, you get passed through device connected, you're into the car, and you're bossing it, you're bashing through the job. Um, do you want to do that software update? Yes or no? And you, you, you're so far into it now that you can't, you, you just go, yes. And at that stage, it may not perform as designed or as intended, and you end up with a bigger problem. And I think for a lot of guys in the UK, if you did a, a survey of guys that have gone the pass-through route, the success comes if you use pass-through for codes and data, actuated testing, but where it comes to sending uh, you know, programming data, where it comes to sending bits and bytes of data into a car, that's one of the areas that would be fenced off as dangerous in my mind. So when it gets to that point, I'm going, that that can lead potentially to disaster where you could end up with a more broken car, which isn't really what we're aiming for. Um, and the difficulty is knowing that and the difficulty is really, you know, working with that in, in your mind. Um, the basic calculation I did in my brain was, what does a new ECU cost? Oh, less than an in interface. Right, interface it is then. Because uh, buying the OE interface is quite expensive. And we have each of those boxes behind me there, Mike, has a, an accompanying laptop. So I have one laptop and one interface. That's the way it's got to be. How do we know that? Because we tried it the other way and it didn't work. There's lots of stress. Um, having multiple installations of an OE tool on one laptop is like having a wife and a girlfriend at the same time. Sounds like a brilliant idea, but it's going to end badly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it was, I, think, I think the last time we spoke, it was just like having a Chinese and an Indian meal at the same time. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not, yeah, it's, it's tricky. So monogamous <laughs> installations are the way forward, yeah. So, so Han, how many boxes are behind you? There's one, two, three, oh, four, uh, five, six, seven. Seven? Uh, yeah, there's seven there. Um, what's oh, the that? Seven. So they've got, your, they've got your interfaces in each one, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah interfaces in each one, and then there's an accompanying laptop for each of the boxes. Yeah, great. Um, and that's the other thing. When you're getting into OE Diag, then, there is a... Like any good relationship, it needs maintaining. So, of course, when you have an OE interface and an OE installation on a laptop, it needs updating, it needs regular maintenance. When you, If you don't maintain them, so somebody's job in the workshop is to regularly touch that thing to make sure it's on the latest Windows version with all the patches and fixes, and it's got the latest up-to-date version of the OE software because pound to a pinch of salt, when you come to use it, you've got that emergency job. You plug the laptop in, you flip it up. Oh, it needs an update. Oh, crikey. How long is that going to take? So for BMW, uh, you have to pay your token fee to access the site, and then you spend the next four hours downloading 86 million bytes of data for the software and the data packets, and you know subscription is ticked over. The car is now delayed. The customer's in reception, and your update install won't go on. It's a, it's a great way to promote gray hair. Yeah, oh, so, yeah. So I've done I, that with Mazda. I think um, oh, James. Yeah. Um, I was talking with James when I was doing my um, Otis install, and I think I think I, I sent him a message. You know, a picture message. James, it's, it's working. Like I'm going to drink champagne tonight, and then Otis ten came out. I had to one install at home, do it all <laughs> again. I wanted to thump myself in the face. I was nearly giving up. If you had here, you wouldn't have had any after Otis. Here. Well, I was too busy worrying about yours, mate. Um, but yeah, that that was that was pretty stressful. Um, I really wish, I really wish Volkswagen would make the update function a bit easier. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then all the uh, flash data files as well, and that take that takes a, a week in in Australian internet because our internet yeah. is one up from dial up. Oh right, yeah, that's Not a mine. trick. Yeah. No, no, that, that's a big that's a big issue actually. The the, the internet speed. There are lots of things you know. Um, I think with a lot of garages that we work with, they think that the OE portal is a bit like having Harry Potter's wand now, that you all of a sudden you can just bing, you know, whatever it is, fix the car, bing, and it just it, it's now the difference. And in fact, it's a it's a relationship that needs a lot of work and effort. And each of those brands has its own set of maintenance uh, woes and and upkeep. Not not difficult, but you just have to factor that in. If you're and what we sometimes feel is the garages are going flat out doing the work they're doing, 
they haven't got time in their life to then maintain or have the upkeep of a dealer tool or several dealer tools. And it's about a dealer tool in your business will cause you, should cause you to refocus what you're doing because having that capability can change what you can offer your customers. But if you keep doing the same old, same old stuff, you just won't have time in your life to learn the tool keep and maintain the tool and, and add that tool add benefit to your business, it will actually pull you backwards and not set you forwards. And I think implementation involves a bit of a plan. It's not difficult, but you just want to think about how you're going to lever this new technician in your workshop to your benefit. Yeah, that's probably one of the things. I think, things Jeff, that- I'm, I'm a testament to that. Like, I've got lots and lots of scan tools, and Jeff turns one on and goes, Mike, you haven't updated this thing. What you turn oh, on? Well, you turn, well, and, and, then, and then there's no password, and it's like, oh shit, I forgot. And he's typing several different passwords, and then it's locked out. You've got to wait 20 minutes. Oh, sorry, Mike. We will. We will. Yeah. Even, no, we it's will just a matter. Of, I've, got, I've now. I got. I got the Sparky to put um, where we store our Pico on our Pico trolley. I said to the Sparky, I said, I want a PowerPoint behind it. I want to leave it on, and and we leave it on, and I want to leave the computer on as often as we can. I want to. T- I randomly just turn it on and now make sure it's updated because I got sick of going to it and going. Oh God, there's an update I've got to do on the Windows, or or, or there's something else. But I mean, I, I now I'm trying to. Uh, Jeff sort of got stuck into me, and 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 went. You got to you got to start using some of these tools. They can't just sit in a drawer. You've got to use them yeah. on different cars and and make sure they're updated and and uh, and things like that. So, I'm, I and yeah. I can imagine if I ended up with seven boxes that are behind you, I you really yeah, I'd almost Mike, I think you'd be employing me. I, I'd just have to quit my job and just go to yours every day and just turn all your computers on. Well, I think there. that's well. No, I think that's almost what has to happen. Like you just have to go weekly. You'd have to. Go, I mean, I know how bad it is with, with with. I mean, I've done some software stuff, um, James, with with Mazda, and every time I get a car in and go, yeah, yeah, it's going to be really quick. I, I I only did that once. Four people went for coffee. Norton's was in Norton's got installed, and they changed to a VPN, and I oh. and I couldn't do it. And they went for a coffee. <laughs> they go, went for a coffee. They came back. I said, I'm sorry, I can't update the software. I don't know what's going on. And I had to reformat the whole hard drive. We, we did everything, started again, and I got it going. And then I don't think I ever saw those people again. It was so, yeah. they never came back. And, and I, <laughs> I was going to. That, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? You, you, it's no good. It's no good. Let's say you could pay somebody just to come and sit next to you while you're at work. And install this. Oh, uh, uh, James, just press that, and it will start scan a car. You, you cannot just get all this technology and and use a customer's car as, as a, a beta test. Same with right. a Pico. Same with same with a, a, a new timing kit. You, you know, timing pin kit. You need to work out what you need to do your homework before you start slotting it in an engine. You know, unless it's something really simple, but. We've got to spend the time to educate ourselves, whether it's YouTube. Taking a long flight to uh, the uh, technical topics uh, HQ, which I'm, I'm pretty sure we should try and arrange at some point, mate. No, I'm, um, I'm, I'm starting to get to a point where I think we really need to go. I'd like to get a bit of an insight into each. I'd like to do a little bit of an intro into each of the, the the manufacturers to get a little bit of an idea how to navigate their sites. But I think long term, I, I, it's not. It's too much. I mean, James, you probably you've done them all. Would you say you could you could happily is is if you got enough brain power to do them all, or do you think yeah. one person could do multiple all seven of the manufacturers that you've got there? Do you think you can, you know, like can you can you comp- compartmentalize your brain enough to do that? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I think I think in answer to that question, you pick. You're probably going to pick three or four that you're going to be able to maintain a level of proficiency in even if you're not using them frequently. So you'll know how to navigate and how to use and operate. Uh, once you go beyond that, I think your the, the normal human brain with all the other stuff that's going on can be a little bit tricky to, to remember that. Um, what we, with two, two things that spring to mind really, with, with Jeff was just saying there, I think if buying a dealer tool is a bit like, uh, if, unless you invest in the pre-research and then the pre-use. So what you're alluding to there, Jeff, was like a Pico scope. We recommend if you want to practice the Pico, do it on a car that isn't broken because you've only got one set of variables then. If you've got a car with some issue, you're not sure if the Pico scope is reading good or bad because of the Pico scope, your settings or the car. So try and just have one set of variables. 
I don't know Pico scope. I know the car is okay. Everything I'm then doing is going to be a me Pico thing, not a me Pico car triangle. And so the dealer tool is exactly the same. Get get it out, get it practiced on a, on a good car to, to understand what you're doing. We often have the analogy with guys that buy a dealer tool. You've just bought a jumbo jet. And unless you take some training, you will go very fast around the airfield on the ground, driving it like a car. So you bought an aeroplane to drive it like a car. Well, that's a neat trick, but you need you need you need to learn how to take off. And then if you were taking off in an aeroplane, they don't let you fly your first flight when the weather's bad, which would be akin to a broken car. So a lot of guys who buy the tool and self-learn are jumbo jetting it round the round the airfield. They they stumble on how to take off and then they fly into a storm. And then and luckily, if they make it back to the airfield, they throw that thing in a heap, never to darken its door again, because the experience was horrendous. <laughs> but it was to do with the it's to do with the journey. It's not, not to do with the tool. It's all about the way that they've implemented their get-go plan. Sure, this is, is ever going to This is why these boxes of Picos, probably worldwide in a, in a dusty corner next to yeah. a mop that doesn't get used as well. I wonder um, how many VC, uh, how many not VC, how many uh, how many Otis units are going to be. Sitting in the corner of workshops for sale, second hand. So, so yeah. Bill, have, so Bill, have, Bill have done everything, and and they've not used it because they've not had the Volkswagen in for a while, and then they go to use it, and then it will tell you to, oh, Update. Um, we want you to change your password or yes. or something yeah. ridiculous. There, there's so many, and the instructions for Otis, and I can only comment on Otis. I've not looked at any others, and and I, I will do once I've, uh, you know, I'm just going to start trying try to uh, grow my hair back from. Uh, installing notice mm-hmm. but um it's just it's just vast yeah the, the instructions are terrible absolutely terrible yeah they are they're not i think the instructions easy. were on the, I, i've got diagrams and i'm like is that windows xp and i'm like mm-hmm. well that look, look you know i i'm monkey see monkey do i'm looking at a picture on a printout because I, i'm a bit old-fashioned and I, and I like to print things out so i can reference to them and, mm-hmm. and i'm like well this file folder looks nothing like the file folder on Windows 10. And yeah, l- luckily, the, luckily uh, I, I know a couple of good people and, and uh, uh, James also gave me a couple of words of uh, advice. And, um, uh, and I've since ordered 6154, the actual interface. Um, so it's your fault, James. I think it's all your fault. <laughs> but, it, it is all my, it all comes back to me. It, it is, yeah. It, it's it's really tricky. You know, the, the most of the instructions and most of the support the dealer tools give aftermarket technicians, what we've got to think is the dealer tool is geared up for the for the franchise network who are bought into the standard, who've got dedicated staff that have this thing. We've been let in. Under the imagine we're in the big top, but we haven't come through the back door. They've lifted up the skirt and let us in the back way. So we're inside the tent now, but we didn't really come through the front door. We're inside that tent now as an anomaly that they don't really know how to handle us because we have BMWs and other peachy one. We have different infrastructure in our workshops than they do in their dealer networks. They're hung up with with fixed wire cable connections to the Ethernet because that's how they do it in the dealer network. We're running Wi-Fi and power line adapters, and it, it can it can be tricky. So um, the instructions that we get from a lot of the dealer tools are an enabling exercise. And the enabling part of the exercise is it enables the dealer portal owner to put a tick in the box that they've got instructions. It doesn't enable anything else. It doesn't enable you to use them to fix the car. It doesn't enable you to get it installed from those. Those instructions are generally that they've just, yes, they exist, move on. They're no good in, in a lot of cases. And, and we spent a lot of time, hard yards really, with understanding the wrinkles and the shortcuts and the issues that you get when you're trying to do this. Uh, and that's one of the things on, on the course, really, there's a coaching about that maintenance and update and installation. And we do therapy. The last Otis course we had here, we had three of the guys bought their gear with them because they had issues you know, with the setup. And and it was, you know, that they, they, they were trying to do updates. They didn't really understand. One of the guys was running on version six and we're now on version 10. Uh, they thought they were doing the updates, but they were doing the install of the updates, but not updating the install. 
And so there's a lot of there's a lot of that um, you know which ne- needs to change. Now, in 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 essence, to your in answer to your question, Jeff, what we've started to do now, and th- this might might be interesting, is that we've made a compassion a, a, a series of a e- sort of e learning, if you like. It's a it's a module set of modules that runs alongside the training that they're broken into very short bite-sized bits that we we've analyzed the questions that we get from text and we've gone right there is a short we've made a short video on how to dot 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 so you might have a, a bmw in that you want to do a programming session on how do you how do you instigate a programming session on an f chassis bmw and um, there's a video on that that talks you through it walks you through it you can watch it on your phone you're sat in the car with your laptop and you can follow along um how do you do an update um what happens when you get this error message and we, we've decided to try and do, it's a lot of effort and work to do it and the first one we've got off the ground is for bmw because that's that's an awkward tool to use as well more germanic fun and games there with odd menus and very nine complicated nine i, I did nine. see the i did nine. see the I, I, obviously i've been following your website you probably see jeff taylor's logged in again with the pervert um yeah. uh, and because i've been because i've been hoping that you might do something for volkswagen now, i do have an interest in in the bmw but I've still yeah. got Otis in my brain, and until I'm until I've got that um, enlightening moment where where I'm really confident, I don't want to start doing another uh, another manufacturer. But I definitely do have an interest in the BMW, and and I think that's fantastic that that you can do that online as well. Um, yeah, because I, I was going to say, James, look, I'd love. I'll, I'm going to try to get over to the UK. I don't know when. I don't know how. Jeff and I will will come over and. We'll have to. We'll have to go via Blackpool. That's fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can all go and have a, a donkey ride uh, and get some rock and for the yeah. <laughs> no. and go see the big well, tower that looks like a we could go and all go and drink some warm beer James yeah, what do you think right. warm, uh, warm fizzy water for me might you yeah. oh, right. yeah. we'll, no, we'll, we'll get you back on the beer by we'll, then. You'll, have to, not, you'll have to move the belt the other way so you know. one question that I, I would like to ask just in case anybody yeah. that's sort of thinking about delving into the uh, OE uh, OE side is yes. it, what's the what's the easiest to navigate and what's the most difficult to navigate? What would you not recommend for a beginner or is uh, is, is this even a, a real question to you? Yeah, it is. It is a real question and it's a it's a valid question. And I, I think I'd go back to the, the the your statement there, Jeff. Is whichever one you start with, start with one. Yeah. Don't try and go to two or three. Um, that has to match your business. So if your business is predominantly a lot of Volkswagens or a lot of Fiat's or a lot of GM go for, or a lot of Ford, go with that tool, make that your first one. Um, but, but, it, but allow enough time, go with your eyes open that it's going to be a bit, a bit of a journey here and it's going to take some time. Don't be expecting to buy the tool on Friday and then on Monday be bossing, you know, software updates and detailed um, guided functions and test plans. Because, um, the, the yeah, start with one is my is my best advice. And when you've got that one under control, then think about your next one. But try and match that to your business. And we, we, we work with some of the guys here and we say, the way to define which one to start with comes from analysing your your previous repair order history so you either look at your existing business and go actually we do a lot of this brand and therefore that seems to be the logical tool choice or we don't do quite so many of this brand but all the faults we get would be supported by the dealer tool or you go completely radically different the mix of cars i've got now are so random I need to pick one to focus on to drive that and develop that brand as a bigger part of my business. Um, and so I think there's there's either the business is going to dictate which tool you start with, or the technician garage owner is going to dictate the direction his business wants to take and support that with the diag. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, no, okay. good. That, that's that's a good, that's a good answer. Well, I think that's what you're doing, Jeff. You know, to go look. You know, you're not. You're, well, look, you're, I, you're, I I love Volkswagen, so you know, I. I I don't need to make a living out of trying to fix cars anymore, but I I have a bit of a passion for it, and I really enjoy helping people as well. But that uh, in in business right now, I can tell you because we're we, I mean we are business partners in the garage network, but also as a 
I, I can contract you and and I can have you come into my workshop. I so so, yeah, so Mike doesn't need to do Volkswagen. So Mike, yeah, you so need that, to do. That takes, you need that to takes pick your. Whole, you need to yeah. pick your next manufacturer. Oh, I'd probably take Mercedes or BMW. I think so I have to. Mercedes is difficult for us because they want us to lease for the equipment. Um, which probably isn't a bad thing. I think it's all pre-installed as well. So maybe that is a good thing. Oh, I, I, I would... start to... James, I was going to say, like, for me as a business owner, I, I always thought possibly I could try to encourage my techs and my employees to to have, I mean, obviously this, this changes as you get, as we get brands that, um, or as you get technicians that leave and those sorts of things, um, it can be it can be difficult in business, but what I mean is, is I could have a couple of guys go, well, you focus on VW, you focus on, you know, I'll send you off to training for VW and and you off for BMW, you off for Mercedes, you off for Toyota, and and we just try to try to split the shop up because I I do work on lots and lots and lots of different brands. We don't specialize in anything. Um, yeah. You know, I, I say this to my customers: the only thing we don't do is paint and panel. Like we do boats. Yeah. Like, I'll, like I'll, I mean, I, 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 we, we do, we do anything and everything. And it's, if it's got a motor in it, we'll fix it. So I, 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 I can relate to where you worked when you were younger. Ago. You're doing a tractor and you're doing a like I'm doing a gearbox on a, on an outboard at the moment, and I'm, you know, we're working on a, we could work on a Porsche, you know, yeah. tomorrow that we that we that we're doing we're pulling a gearbox out of, you know. So it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's got a motor in it, we'll work on it. So it's really difficult. It's, it's a difficult place to be. It is a difficult place to be. Um, and I suppose philosophically, you've got to decide, are you driving your business or is your business driving you? Um, that's always a question rhetorically. The second thing is, um, yeah, it's a great point whether you specialize with a tech that is, is, is a good general tech and has got a specialism in the brand that you choose. So if you pick three brands that you want to go deep to the level on that 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 guy or girl is your go-to specialist and has had the training and really is is the primary user but is co-training the, the other guys to do basic functions so you know bmw service updates for instance you, you need to be semi-competent in what you're doing but you could be shown how to do that then when you get a bmw for service and you want to do the online service updates everyone can do it so there are core functions the deep stuff, your specialist tech, and then you know everyone has to be able to be able to be 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 competent at, at sort of set level A. Um, again, partly your business geography dictates which tool is going to be right for you. So if you're in the middle of nowhere and you are the only garage in town, um, you're going to have to do everything, and the dealer journey may not be right for you. And um, you know. It's as tempting as it may seem to to be able to do that stuff. It may not be fit for your business. That's a decision only you can make. And I think the analysis comes from, will it add value to your business? Will the overhead of implementing, learning, keeping it, using it going to be less hassle than shipping those odd cars off to the representative dealer or specialist in your area? Um, or, Or the other way is, you know, the garage network where you've got, co-owners and garages in your locality and you actually agree to share the load i'm going to pick volkswagen so this is you, this is something that we spoke about yeah um i think that's a fantastic idea yeah, i think that's where we'll end up in the future i mean i'm gonna i'm actually gonna look i i try to run the business i made a couple of really conscious decisions in the last two years last 18 months one of those was to start going when I mean, i'm a marine mechanic and i have been i love boats to me life that's is the boat boats. nerd you're a boat nerd, man. Well, cars are a means to a bigger boat for me, James. So when you're out here, we'll take you out on the boat. Uh, um, but but I, I made it. I made a very conscious decision a little while ago, based on the fact of what I know is coming, which is EV and hybrid and workload, and and with a with a with a background of having some customers who've had some terrible terrible experiences with marine mechanics in Australia who have no idea how to diagnose issues, who just literally threw parts of the boat. The eight thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand dollar invoice to find that it was a someone had put a one way valve in the wrong way in a fuel system, uh, and it was and it was a fifth. It took me fifteen minutes and was five dollars to fix for mm. a, for, a, for a, a friend of a friend who I felt so terrible because I they asked me to look at the boat when they bought it and I said look I don't do that I just don't yeah. do them anyway. Two eighteen months later they they were at their wits end and these poor people this poor couple will never own another boat. And, and I love, 
I love boats and I love everything, the joy that they bring to me and my family and, and what we do. And and I and I was just I was absolutely gutted for them that someone had put a a, a bloody ball valve in a fuel system that it took me blowing through a piece of hose to go, that shouldn't be there. We shouldn't have a one-way valve that restricts flow going to the motor. Like, what the hell is going on? So I unscrewed it, did it, fix the problem, done, never a problem again. Five, And I said this, it's 15 bucks. The poor bugger had $8,000 worth of invoices to pay to a marine mechanic who just kept saying it needed this, it needed a computer, needs a, needs a, it needs a fuel pump, okay? They put a fuel pump in. Uh, and unfortunately, you got to pull the motor out. Uh, needs that. And then they say, oh, it needs a computer. I said, look, let me have a look. I'll put my Pico on it. Don't like taking my Pico near the water, but we'll take it, you know, we'll have a bit of a look. And I went, this is just running out of fuel. And it was it was just a really sad, for me, it was just a really sad story. For And, and, and I went, right, bugger this. I'll start doing this and I'll do it properly. And, uh, and part of that is to go, well, moving on into the future, you've got to start looking at your business to go, well, what? what's going to have legs and what's going to run out of legs and what do, if we're going to get less customers going into the EV hybrid world, we need more customers. What has a motor? What are we going to do? Diversify, adapt, pivot, change. It's what we're really good at um, as, as an industry and, and that was part of my decision-making to go right and we'll start servicing all these. But a lot of them are still carbureted and fuel-injected and they're not going to see, electrify see, anytime soon. That that yeah, can no, segue no. nicely in, into into one more topic that I have, and that is, um, I think that marine mechanic, I think maybe we sh- we should send him a copy of uh, diagnostic assistance. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> so that is something, James. That is something that I f- completely forgot. I was just that excited. Um, James <laughs> is the um, author, author, designer. Yeah. And, Builder yeah, yeah. made made diagnostic assistance or auto solve or what do you, whatever you call it, and yeah. and that has just gone through a change as well, hasn't it? That's gone. Yeah. That, that's had a bit of an update. Do you know? I what? need to update. I, to I, you haven't, I haven't got it. I haven't got the new one. Sorry, James. I'm going to do it now. No, no, no worries. No, yeah, it's, uh, that's another interesting, an interesting bit of a story there. But yeah, that that's that fell under uh, fell under the wing of technical topics. Um, we originally started working at that as a sort of consultant level. The two guys, uh, uh, Steve and Simon, that had that um, were, were were working at that for a long, long time, and they sort of reached the end of the road with it. Um, they went their separate ways. I started working with them before that happened as a sort of technical consultant, writing articles and that sort of thing. Because one of my part-time, full-time jobs was writing stuff for magazine, technical articles and case studies and that sort. Um, but I got involved with that business. They, those guys sort of went their separate ways. Simon and I were working at that then for another few years. And then Simon, who was full-time working with the REC at that stage, um, it was quite a lot of commitment full-time as well as doing that business. And um, it, it, I, I essentially bought that business from Simon. I bought him out as the as we were co-shareholders, then I, I bought his his she- section of that business out, took it under the wing of technical topics. And then, yeah, we have it as a product, uh, almost remote learning and support product. And it contains, some, some people say, what's in it? Well, sort of the stuff that if you came here, I, we would talk about and I would guide you through, um, but in a format that you can use on your computer. So, um, yeah, guys use it as pre-job research, as uh, helping to expand their knowledge in areas they don't really understand. Um, the, the partnership originally came from working with Pico. And so back in the day, Autosolve wrote the Pico help files. So when Pico were growing up through and they didn't really have an automotive section, Autosolve made all of the onboard support files for Pico. Um, and they made some adapters and leads and clips. And the other things you, you see with Pico actually were, yeah, the brainchild of the Autosolve business. Um, and so, yeah, that, that product's been through a bit of a change. We, we It was using a bit of an older platform, and we caught a cold with Windows 7. The authoring package that that software's written in wouldn't be supported. And um, we had a big sort of six or seven-month plan of getting people who were on the older version to upgrade to the new Windows 10 version. Um, and that that happened sort of during pre-COVID. It's all a, a little bit in the in the in the history, but yeah, we moved that over to a Windows 10 friendly platform, and um, we also moved it to a subscription model, which yeah was a bit of a brave step because it was previously pay once and use it forever. Um, 
but we came to the decision that we couldn't give it the uh, we couldn't put the effort in to update the content because there was no ongoing revenue. And so you bought this software and it was fixed in time. Um, but we couldn't add new stuff because there was no money. We were busy doing training and we could say, hang on a minute, we've got a training course to run or we have to go and put some time into diagnostic assistance and there's no revenue to pay the wages of the guy that's doing the writing. And so we just took the decision we look, to make this product move forward. We have to switch to a revenue model. Now, it's very modest in terms of it. It's, it's a pound a day for techs here. To, to run that subscription and it rolls over every year you get the new content um, and yeah a lot of guys use it as a supplementary um yeah learning and education no, is it is it fun. is it kind of like and look i kind of know the answer to this but other people might not but is it like having a bonnet open and a head scratching moment where you know whether it's a networking fault a diesel fault a petrol fault is it kind of like having you stood behind them Sort of, yeah. you know, maybe not, maybe not putting at a broken wire, but maybe giving them the tools that they need to find a broken wire. Yeah, yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, it's like, yeah, and somebody once said it's like your clever friend in yes. the fact that, yeah, you can just bob in there for a bit of. Sometimes we run in a, in the in the logical process of diagnosis. It's very easy. The psychology of the human brain is really interesting, and we get caught by all sorts of things. Like the my favorite one is a bias. So if you start off a job thinking you know what it is, but you're you're kidding yourself, I'm going to go to that job with an open mind, you've actually got a bias in place, which is you are like a moth to a light bulb. Your bias is the thing you think it is, and you keep flying into that light bulb, dinking your head, going, yes, but yes, all the evidence is showing you it's not. But you've got this idea that it's this, and you sort of, you, you cod yourself on that it's something that it isn't. So this bit of software also gets you out, it breaks that thing. So you, you're stuck, you're lacking inspiration, you've done that test and you're sort of not getting the answers that you want to. Yeah, you can bob in there. It's broken into little bite-sized bits where you can have a quick read and there'll be a ding, bloody right. That's that's what that, oh, right, change, change gear, change track, change direction. James, I bought it 13 years ago. And and we and and I I'm I'm upset that I didn't upgrade it and I haven't updated it yet. But I but I used it as my sounding board. And you say it's your clever friend. To me, it was a bit of navigational guidance when I was flying my jumbo that I was driving around on the ground when I had my pico into the <laughs> storm and going, what does what the hell should I be seeing here? And I would I love the fact that it would it would it would give me a pico like a, give me a, ref, a reference to, re, what we needed we needed reference to, i mean for me i needed a reference i needed something yeah you know. it used to have a a, a link in, and it would like hyperlink to yes to pico to pico yes. six and I, I, does. I, does it work with pico seven yeah, yeah it still works yep all that works oh well, mate, so, so so like, it'll, it'll can we please attach a link 7. we need we need a link at the bottom of this because i'll buy i'm buying it straight away I need it back again because it was one of those things that when I was testing something that I, I thought I knew how it was, and you talk about your bias, you go in there and you think, I think I know how this works. I'm going to test it. Oh crap! Is this what? Is this the sort of? Is this the sort of injector that I think it actually is? I'm going to go back and I'm going to go. Oh, hang on. There's a piezo injector. There's this one and there's this one and there's. Oh my god, which one am I actually testing? And you go back and do a bit. You just just work backwards. And go, oh yeah, that's. Hang on, I'm doing that one because that's the waveform I'm getting. And that's exactly yeah. what I'm seeing. And then I go, okay, right. So I know that's okay. So let's go yeah. on to the next thing and go, all right. So, and I, I used to give it to um, Jeff when Cody started working for us. I said to Cody, I said, here, take this home, go through and have a look. Just have a look at all, click on each different thing and just have a look at each different sensor and different injector and get an idea and an understanding about how, how it actually, how things actually work. And it gives you a great overview and a great, it's just that, especially when you're not doing things all the time. And, and and you're not like you know as, as techs we're servicing or i'm doing water pumps i'm doing belts i'm doing you know you're not always just doing diagnostic work as much as i love i love curly jobs like you do james um sometimes i don't i, I generally seem to get them when i don't want them but you, you know when you're under under other pressures um but uh but yeah i i, I think it, I, I need that refresher i need that to go back and have a read about how it actually works to to get it right and i loved it for that i absolutely loved it oh, that's cool that's great to hear thanks is, is yeah. there, um is there a, is there is it like a, a walkthrough on the website that we could share on the garage network just so people yeah. can understand what what we're discussing yes and, and the, it, the, 
There is a link, yeah. There's a link to on the site. There's some short videos, Jeff, which yeah. give you, if you've never seen it, give you a sort of walkthrough of, of what it is. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be useful if you don't know. But again, like Mike's identified there, a lot of guys use it with with and improvers that are trying to move on. Um, you know, the thing with, with learning in this game is you don't know what you don't know until you know that you don't know it. And it's a really weird thing, right? So you, you, could, you could write a book, you know, James. You, not talk, just, just you know, analogies. It's just, yeah. yeah. Well, no, but that is that is the well, we our life is an. It's so good. You're right. You yeah. don't know what you know until you don't. You know that you don't know it. That's exactly. I, I, right. I, th yeah. I think maybe we need a a, 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 a Sydney TT HQ. What do you think? <laughs> you, could, you, you could you could you could just fly out when it gets cold in the UK. We could, we, we, could, we could keep the beer warm for you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it'd be good. Yeah, and you know, it, it's it's a heartening thing. I think that we, although we're we're so far apart, actually, the, the the issues that we face, and with our colleagues in in the America as well in the states, that the the car is a machine with a wheel in each corner, and the stuff that's between the two bumpers is very similar. We've got global manufacturers making a car for all markets. The problems we see are very similar. The customer issues that we face are similar, very similar. The problems that we face as technicians are also very similar. And um, I, I think, you know, just helping, realizing that we're all going to get stuck at some stage, realizing that there's no shame in, in identifying that. And, and in fact, I love it when, when I get stuck. Fantastic. That's an opportunity for learning. I've run off the road of my knowledge. I thought I knew that, but I didn't because I'm stuck at that. That gives me an opportunity to go away and learn. And, you know, we, we, we have a saying, uh, um, you, 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 you either win or you learn. And, and when you bear that in mind, because also it can be quite a depressing situation. When you get a curly job that is spanking you around the workshop, it's eight or nine o'clock at night and your tummy is rumbling and you think I should have been home for tea hours ago. The phone's ringing. Your wife is there saying, where are you? The dinner's in the dog. And you're really up against it. I, I think it's having sometimes that mental attitude to go, actually, this is a learning perspective um, and, and to realize the things I don't know is capturing those and realizing actually it, it's an opportunity to go and fill that gap when do you make time to fill the gap when have you got in your diary or your calendar when you when you diarize in calendar time uh, interesting yesterday I, I cataloged my we have cpd here so you have continuing professional development and I think at the moment, I'm up to 200 hours this year for CPD. So the train, the trainer that trains everyone else that should know everything, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing probably five, six hours a week on self-development, on learning stuff, because I'll have a thought process. I'll, we still do. I do a lot of car fixing by remote control, like you were saying with you, Jeff, in your Odis installation. When you get stuck, that for me is a brilliant opportunity for me to test my knowledge, to be able to share that with you and go, OK, this is how you do that. The guys that we've got on programs, we've got probably seven or eight. Uh, cohorts that are going through at different stages. We have a WhatsApp group. The guys are posting stuff about jobs they're struggling with or waveforms they've got. And it's a brilliant way of, uh, of sort of benchmarking your own knowledge and getting involved in that to identify when you've got a gap. But the clever thing is penciling in a bit of time to fill that gap in. And linking back to diagnostic assistance it can do that for you where you start to investigate the thing you don't know and that leads you on a, a little bit of a journey to go well actually i also don't know about the next level so now i've got the components sussed but now i don't know um, and we often talk about this you know the modes enabling criteria for faults and one of the things that we've done in the latest version is talk about strategies that ecus employ to set a code. So EGR is a, is a big one for the minute with diesels and ad blues. Where is the EGR monitoring for low flow on a high pressure EGR? When it's does it start to six. set that code? Is that in mode six? Yeah, it's in it's, it's mode six. So it's a it's a it's a P it's so it's a P code and it but it's in a specific operation zone of the engine and it will only flag low flow on the high pressure EGR in a set RPM and, and torque 
zone. So if you're chasing a fault and your customer's not driving the car in the way that the fault can be enabled, you'll never see the fault. If the wife drives the car and she's driving it in a different status, she's always down at the lower torque and the lower speed, she's living in the low flow EGR zone and it will flag the code. And just stuff like this where you go, I've got this intermittent problem in the workshop that I can't get to the bottom of, I can't get it to set the code. Yeah, that software there is just to highlight and get you to think about those things and expand your knowledge. When when you get a question of, I don't know, it really turns into a question is, I need to know, I need to learn, and I need to go away and fill that gap. And that will, you know, that, that knowledge is an investment in the future. Once you learn one thing, you've got that forever. And, you know, learn it young and you'll be brilliant through the rest of your career you'll take off but as, a, as an old dog we can still learn new tricks and it's really identifying the learning opportunities that face us every day and like my, when you're too busy it's really tricky where's your whiteboard of learning opportunities where's your notepad where's the file on your phone of when i sit down and i've got 10 20 30 minutes to to fill the gaps what are the gaps I, I've, I've stumbled on this week or this month and that's the ultimate self-development. I'm a voracious learner. I, I, I will never stop learning. I love it. I love it to bits. Hmm. And it's one of those ways that we, we advance our knowledge. I like it. Oh, that's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. We still need you in Australia. Yeah. You're, you're not getting out of it. That easy. <laughs> well, actually, um, well, Joe, that was one of the other questions I had. Is, is, is any of your courses online? Well, I mean, other than you've got a few tips and tricks online, but most of it's face to face, isn't it? Yeah, it is the de the dealer tool training. Uh, Mike is coming, so that we've got the the oldest one, which Jeff will be happy with, is just in the in the final edit now, and that will appear you said that online. A couple of weeks ago, James, I, I've been writing this down in my special book. <laughs> you said this a couple of weeks ago. No, uh, uh, can, can I? Can I? I want to be your first. I want to be your first uh, uh, member for for that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. keep uh, absolutely. Yeah, it's really it's really tricky, and it, it, we we sort of generally keep all this stuff quiet because it can get people get quite excited and go, "Well, is, is it is it ready yet?" And we're going, "Well, it's it's sort of in the final edit, and that might be till it might not come until January. By the time we we get it uploaded and make sure that the technology works, it's reliable, and all the um you know all the art wrinkles are, are ironed out. But if we get an early version, Jeff, I'd be more than happy." For you to be my guinea pig, as long as you promise not to shout at me if there's any, if there's no, any no, gaps. No, not at all. Well, well. So if you don't release that, like oh, over Christmas, I'm going to have to watch the BMW one. <laughs> what do you reckon, <laughs> mate? Oh, big screen BMW and a load of beers. What do you think? <laughs> if we're on yeah, the boat, I'm happy. That sounds like my idea of heaven. That yeah, yeah and because you, you guys are in the summer, we could have a barbecue going as well. So. Oh my yeah. lord! I could get. Come out, come out, we could, listen, you just got to come over. Just fly out, fly out for Christmas. After Christmas, just come out. We're closed for a couple of weeks, James. Come on, I'll take you fishing. Oh, oh, sounds good. Sounds luxurious. <laughs> defrost. 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 Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's this weather. So yeah. I, I definitely think moving forwards, um, we'd definitely like to do more with with yourself and and TTHQ. And uh, you know, I, I could just talk to you for hours. I'm I'm looking at the clock now. We've, we've been on we've been on for an hour, well, an hour and fifty minutes because we, we were waiting for Mike to remember his password. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think I don't think we've even scratched the surface yet. Um, no. But uh, you know, I know you're a very busy man, James. You don't want to be uh, minus your hours of the day. But um, do you know what I've got? I've got the, uh, today, today I've got the I've got the Mirai, so I'm I'm getting stuck into the Mirai today. So I'm I'm on a geek out day. Um, I'm on a training course. Would you believe for hydrogen? So every Thursday afternoon, I fly over to Northern Ireland. And uh, I, I get ready for a course on Friday and I do a Friday of hydrogen learning. So I'm going through a, a, a program at the minute to get geeky on hydrogen. So I'm, I'm sat in a classroom with some very clever guys, heating engineers. Um, there's two guys that run a, uh, that work for their engineers on a bus company. Um, so I'm doing some geeky this week. We're getting into fuel cells for transportation. So um, I'm doing live data graphing, and uh, today I'll be getting the Picoscope out and looking at the fuel stack 
um, current and voltage. I, I found a book on the internet, so I'm reading on, on the way back from the flight about PEM fuel cells and how you do the diagnostics. So I found some things written by a, a professor about how you diagnose the capability of a fuel cell. And this morning, I'm going to give it a whirl. So uh, it's a bit it's a bit interesting. So uh, all, all, um, and that's what I'm, my, my day is going to be geeking out with PicoScope, the Toyota factory tool, and I'll be wheel, spearing the, wheel spinning the Mirai up and down the train a state capturing data. <laughs> <laughs> I've been green. The, the, the production is green, but all the all the all the micromolecules from the from the tires are gonna are gonna cancel that out. I'll probably end up being a net, net gross polluter this morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Well, um, we're gonna do something moving forwards, James. I'm not sure 100 percent what it is yet, but we'll, we'll work we'll to. work on that. But um, yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, and we kept it clean because yeah. the first time we had a chat, it was, um, you know, it, it was, um, yeah, uh, it was. We very, had a chindian very meal. Yeah, we had a chindian yes. meal, but uh, uh, um, it's all, I always a pleasure. Much, I may have had too much coffee the last time we spoke. That was probably what. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think me and Mike were on the beers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I I purposely behaved tonight just. To, you know, to try and keep it semi-professional. Mike can always lower the tone and, and it balances out. But uh, um, so I, I'd like to, I want, I want to share um, the links to your OE training, especially for BMW and the yes. uh, diagnostic assistance. So if you see the post on the Garage Network and if anybody wants to ask questions, if you want to chime in and, and yeah. you know, if you've got the time, or you might be doing wheel spins in your broken uh, hybrid. Uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll, I'm I'm signing up for another round of diagnostic assistance. I got that from Joe. From I was Joe's meant to do doing. it. I, I was meant to no, do no, it. We, and, we and got a, uh, James. It was quite funny. Jeff and I got on the plane uh, to go to the uh, for a, to a conference on the Gold Coast, and uh, and I turned to him and I said, "Hey, when were we supposed to do that?" <laughs> the diagnostic assistance thing and jeff goes it was yesterday and then, oh, oh wow. it was one of those moments but look at i said look it doesn't matter because i i want access back to it again and uh, i'm doing some videos um joe my uh my cert for and 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 when i did my certificate for in advanced diagnostics my old tafe teacher and myself are doing some some very simple testing and making some videos which we're posting on the garage network and on youtube at the moment and joe got me, joe introduced me to uh to to to, to your program well it would have been 13 years ago 10 10 years ago when when i did my cert for and it was one of those things that that i went joe showed it to me in in, in a little the little plastic case that it came in and uh and i went the next day i i went home from 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 tech and and i and i bought it and i had it and I, it was the best and i and i've shared it with every a lot of my staff have used it uh, over these uh, how many logins do we get we get one login and you oh, log no, in on multiple the, devices the, yeah no we changed it yeah we changed it. so you get a couple of logins now we, we've gone away from the little dongle so it's all done on the We've got a, a licensing service, so you can install, you can rate, basically install it on multiple PCs, and you can have two consecutive logins, so yeah, two cool. people can use it at the one time at the minute. But yeah, because it's nice to be able to give that to some of the some of the younger guys and younger people that, or girls that are coming through uh, yeah. through the through the business, and I can go look to go and familiarise yourself with how sensors work and how things work. Go and have a read and look, you know, scroll through and. And get a bit of an yeah. idea, and I'd like them to take that to do that. I give them that as a little project to go and do in their own time. So, right. um, but yeah, that's the that, that way they could download it and have a look at it at home and when it, they're in their own time. I hope they do that, but you know. Oh, oh no! I, I saw the video. Joe was the guy you did the electrical testing with, was it? Yes. I saw yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no. Well, you have to pass my thanks. I don't know Joe personally, but I'll pass my thanks on to to Joe uh, for for inspiring you. That's uh, oh, no, 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 Joe was my inspiration for that. And I'll make sure I let him know. He's just but he just sent me a text before he said, "When when are Jeff and I doing the when are, when are the three of us getting <laughs> together again to do the next round?" I said, "Next week, Jeff. Is that okay?" Oh well, it is now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, next <laughs> week. Well, that's it. We've just made it. We've made it. Yeah, happens. no. Let, let's do it. We'll uh, we'll we'll give um we'll give uh, James uh, James a plug. We'll. Uh, yeah, we'll pretend James is with us. Yeah, that's all right. That's we'll all have a we'll have a, all have a warm beer and pretend we're cold and oh, that's all. We'll put big jackets on and well, yeah. I just sent him a picture because I said, "Hang on, shh, I'm, I'll, I'll I'll call you in a minute. I'm on a uh, I'm on a Zoom <laughs> meeting with James Dillon." And I sent him your photo. I'm in the I was smiling. So 
Yeah, it's really good. Right then, well, look, I, I think we'll, we'll probably end the podcast, but I, I'd like to just have a quick chat be, um, be, before everybody goes. But um, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, James, as always. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next one, and I'm looking forward to you coming to Australia. Yeah, thanks so much, We're going to plan that. Thank you so yeah, much, James. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, thanks, thanks guys. Good as always. Brilliant to catch up. And, uh, and thanks, everybody, for watching or, or listening, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Ciao for now. Bye for now. See you guys. Don't forget to join our private Facebook page if you are an automotive technician and also subscribe to our YouTube and our podcast channel. They are all called The Garage Network. Thanks, guys, and see you next time.